Welcome to Hot Chips 20. Session 2. Video and Media. Hiro Hayashi. Hiro Hayashi received his bachelor's uh, and master's in electrical engineering from Kyoto University. And he has been with Toshiba uh, for quite a few years now, working in the research uh, group on uh, development of on research and develop, uh, advanced development of microprocessors and computer systems. Prior to that, he worked as a log logic designer of PowerPC Core in the Cell project. And currently, he is uh, directing a front end design team. So, uh, welcome, as uh, Hiro, yeah. Hi, Shishan. Yeah, thank you, Prabhuji. Okay. Uh, I will talk about Spart Engine, which is a high-performance media, uh, high-performance stream processor. Here's the outline of my presentation. Uh, let me start from the background of Spart Engine. Uh, what is the next? Okay, what is the major target PC? Uh, we think it's, it, it is high definition video processing. HD error has been emerging quickly. Most of the video contents are moving to HD. On the other hand, uh, sorry. Oh, HD contents require much more processing power than SD contents. For example, current CPU and GPU can decode HD video in real time, but it's still hard to encode HD video, HD video in real time, even for high-end uh, CPU and GPU. Uh, we will have much more video contents YouTube is one of the movement. After having a digital steel camera, we, will, we are taking much more uh, cameras than before. Now we can buy two giga, non, two giga NAND flash memory just for 10 bucks. So short movies will be more casual by having cheaper NAND flash memories. Uh, to handle lots of video data. Intelligent software capability, like indexing and searching video image, will be crucial. And it is hard for hardware, uh, hardware solutions to provide the advanced and flexible uh, intelligent software ca capability, uh, advanced and flexible algorithms. Uh, here is a characteristic of video data. It's large, so it's usually uh, compressed and decoded, and it requires a huge processing power. Oh, sorry. So, to handle video data, the combination of encode, decode, and huge image processing power is crucial. Next is a uh, spot engine architecture overview. So to propose, uh, to solve the issue I talked to, we propose a spot engine. It's a media processing accelerator. It has four SPs derived from, derived from cell broadband engine, which were developed by Sony Group, IBM, and Toshiba. And SP are fully compatible with those of cell broadband engine. And SPARS engine also has a hardware codex. Here is an overview of SPE, a synergistic processor element. It's a simple, smooth processor core. 
SP was presented in Hot Chips 2005, so I won't talk about it in detail today. So the most important feature is it's, it has high oh, sorry, it has a high compute density. Uh, it's a very power efficient and area efficient. And the video application requires much more higher bandwidth than conventional applications. And processor element, encoder, decoders, and high bandwidth local memory should be tightly coupled together to guarantee high, band, high, data, band, uh, high data transfer bandwidth. In typical usage of uh, Spurs engine as a stream processor, only, stream, uh, only encoded stream are transferred on the PCI Express bus. But the PCI Express interface still capable to transfer uh, H HD raw data in YUV or RGB in format if you need. So Spurs engine works as a backend processor. Spurs engine is attached on the PCI Express bus in a PC system. It doesn't interfere in PC system bus with CPU and GPU. So next I'll talk about the implementation of Spurs engine. Uh, here is a block diagram of Spurs engine. As I described before, it has four SPEs, and it has H.264 uh, and MPEG2 encoder and decoders. And it also has PCI Express interface with DMAC, and, it, uh, and XDR DRAM interface, and SCP, a control processor. These units are connected by three buses among which required data bandwidths are divided. So here is a specification overview of uh, Spurs engine. Only one, uh, also, only SPE is 1.5 gigahertz clock domain, and the others are 150 megahertz or 300 megahertz clock domains. All codecs have support high, uh, high profile Full HD video contents. And memory controller interfaces with XDR memory and provides high memory bandwidth with small pin counts. And several power management functions are implemented to reduce power consumption. Here is, here is a summary of physical implementation and die photograph. So Spurs engine is developed by using synthesizable design methodology for shorter time, shorter design time and time and less manpower. This was very challenging for 1.5 gigahertz domain for SPEs. Prior to Spurs Engine project, we developed a test chip consists from only one SPE. This work was reported on VLSI Symposium 2007. So design methodology developed for the test chip was also applied to this project. There are several key features. Uh, today, I will talk about two of them, floor plan optimization and hybrid standard cell height. The first backend design key feature is floor plan optimization. The left is a original SP floor plan image for 65 nanometer cell broadband engine SPE. And right is a one for Spurs engine. The original plan from consists, consists from MFC portion and three slender portions. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, data pass and control pass and local storage. Uh, in this flow plan, uh, data from local storage go up to top and goes down to go through the data pass. 
a new floor plan used for Spurs engine, which is almost square, uh, has a higher self-placement flexibility. As a result, the area and the total wire length can be minimized. The area of the logic portion in new flow plan is at about 30% smaller, and the total wire length is also 30% smaller. Uh, the second back-end design key feature is a hybrid standard cell height implementation. We used uh, uh, 12 grid cell height and 9 grid cell height standard cell libraries to minimize delay, area, and power. 2 grid height is used for 1.5 gigahertz domain only, and 9 grid height is used for the other clock domains. This table shows the frequency area estimation in monolithic standard height implementation. If nine grid cell, only nine grid cell is used, uh, clock frequency is limited to 1.25 gigahertz. If only 12 grid cell is used, uh, chip area will be increased by seven square millimeters. So next, I would like to talk about the pro programming model of Spurs engine. Here's a uh, programming hierarchy of Spurs engine. <coughs> the system software for host system and Spurs engine are provided by Toshiba as firmware or uh, OS driver. Some libraries and SP code are also provided. User, pr user programmer can develop his program by using these APIs, and he can also develop by using SP, uh, SP programs also. Standard OS, OS API, like uh, Microsoft DirectX API, can be encaps encapsulated by these structures. A common SPU runtime offers a common API to various cell broadband engine-based systems. It can be applied to Spurs engine system too. Sony is uh, developing a uh, common SPU runtime called MARS for cell broadband engine. Uh, Toshiba is also, uh, porting it to cell, uh, Spurs engine. So co common SPU runtime offers scalability of SPU program from Spurs engine-based PC to cell-based supercomputer. So next, uh, I will present application program for Spurs engine and the result of power performance evaluation for them. Uh, these are new applications enabled by Spurs engine. Today, I will talk about the first four super real-time transcoding, and super resolution, and indexing, and gesture interface. Okay. The first application is transcoding. Uh, combining full encode and decode hardware with SP software, Spaz Engine can provide flexible transcoding features. So, SP software flexibly, co flexibly converts uh, resolution, frame rate, and aspect ratio with transcoding simultaneously. Uh, this, is a, this table shows the result of performance evaluation for various transcoding by tra uh, Spurs engine. As you see, uh, Spurs engine can transcode faster than real time even for full HD video. It, uh, it is hard to encode Full HD H.263 format in real time by using latest high-end microprocessor. But Spurs Engine can do about twice faster than real time. 
And this number means uh, one hour SD contents can be transcoded about 10 minutes. So I think uh, people have uh, experience in home video editing. Uh, I, uh, he can understand how fast this is. So this is a transcoding performance comparison with Intel Quadruple processor. Spars engine is about 10 times faster than 2.8 GHz Quadruple on HD video transcoding. So note that uh, CPU and most of SPE are not used in this application and reserved for intelligent processing on, with Spaz engine system. And this is a result of power performance comparison on HD transcoding. Spaz engine system consumes about half compared to the CPU only system. And it, it's about 10 times faster. As a result, uh, this results in about 18 times better power performance. Next application is video indexing. Uh, during, uh, during video transcoding, uh, face, faces in video contents are detected in real time. The detect, detected face uh, shows as icons like this. And by clicking one, one of these icons, the movie starts playback from at the point. Uh, these user interface can give users whole view of the program. Uh, and the user can jump to anywhere he or she wants by just one click. This is an example of new user interface enabled by Spaz engine. Uh, this is a result of a performance comparison between Spaz engine and Quadruple processor on face detection processing. S same algorithm of main portion of face detection is implemented on Quadruple processor and compiled by Intel compiler with full performance optimization options enabled. Transcoding is not included in this measurement. X-axis shows each video frames, and Y-axis shows the time, uh, processing time of each uh, video frame. Uh, processing time depends on, the, on each frame. Uh, for example, uh, if a frame contains many faces, it takes time. This frame mean, uh, has includes many faces. And this is line for the, uh, real time, uh, 30 frames per second. Spaz engine can process face detection in real time, uh, transcoding with, during transcoding with hardware codecs. Next application is a gesture interface remote control. Again, uh, sorry, uh, by detecting uh, okay. by detecting shape of hand gestures, you can control uh, PC without using mouse or keyboard. So video data from camera is processed in real time and. Uh, Image det detection is also done by Spaz engine. And this is a performance evaluation re result. This graph shows mean frame per second to process gesture control on seven sets input images. Uh, 
again, uh, 30 frames per second is uh, smooth real-time uh, borderline of smooth real-time gesture control. 2SP achieved uh, 30 FPS processing speed. And these numbers are relative performance to uh, Quartudio processor one core. Uh, during Spurs engine is processing in gesture control interface. Uh, host processor is free and can process its productive work in parallel. Okay. Uh, last application is a super resolution. Uh, super resolution convert a standard definition video to sharper and cleaner high definition video. So there are several methods to, for super resolution. Our method looks for similar image patterns in a frame and estimate high resolution image by using patterns found. Here is a performance comparison of super resolution kernel code processing time. The, ta the table shows the processing time per frame using one core. Uh, so this process is easy to parallelize to multi multiple cores frame by frame. So Spurs engine, which has 4 SP, is 4.2 times faster than Core 2 Duo, which has two cores. So Spurs engine can execute uh, super resolution, super resolution processing, and process encode and decode by using hardware codecs in parallel. On the other hand, Core 2 Duo has to execute all these processes by using two cores by turns. An estimation of total processing time using transcoding speed. Spurs engine is about eight times faster than Core 2 Duo processor. I'd like to conclude my presentation. Uh, Spurs engine has been successfully developed. Spurs engine architecture is designed for intelligent HD video processing. It works as a back-end processor, and it provides both flexible, flexible programmability and optimal power and performance. Uh, its video processing capability is demonstrated by using several real applications. Uh, at the end of my presentation, I'd like to give my thanks to all people who contributed to the Spurs Engine project. People from all over Toshiba made this real. Thank you for listening. I'll take time for questions. Can you use this processor to recognize and delete commercials? <laughs> what commercials? Commercials, like advertisements, commercials. If you can, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to buy, buy one. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can buy a uh, Spaz Engine enabled PC already, so <laughs> please write. <laughs> Hi, Koji Suginima from Sony Corporation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a question regarding to the uh, transcoding. Mm -hmm. So your transcoder, uh, what kind of the contribution of SPE for transcoding? Oh, as I mentioned. Uh, okay, so, oh, uh, uh, SP does uh, convert size of frame or 
uh, converting uh, frame rate or something. Uh, so encoder and decoder just encode and decode. So uh, SPE uh, process the mediate, mediate uh, images. So for example, the one of the example is the size of uh, size of image. Does it, work, does it work as a front end and back end, or it's intermediate? I'm intermediate saying. processing only. Okay. Hi, I think I read in your presentation where you uh, allow a user to program the SPEs. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you uh, do you have an SDK for that, or do you just use the IBM SDK, or do you? No, no, uh, we uh, prepare the SDK for Spaz engine. For this specific product. Yes, okay. correct. Okay, thanks. My name is Jason Wang from Sony Computer Entertainment. Mm -hmm. My question is, in your hardware decoder and the encoder, what kind of profile is supported, especially uh, for H.264? Yeah, uh, it supports, okay, where am it? So, so it supports encoder, so this one. Oh, no, I sorry, see. yeah, high profile and level uh, 4.1. How I'm sorry. How much user can control for the code stream, like uh, IPB or picture type, number of reference or stuff, uh, number of slices? So uh, I I don't have the correct uh, detailed information now. Oh, I see. thank you. Sorry. Last question. Sorry about that. Forrest Worthman, Worthman Associates. Hmm? Uh, is this chip a commercial product available? Yes. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>worked on this project. We come from the VLSI Computation Lab at UC Davis. I'll introduce the basic goals of our project, which will give you a background and motivation for why we have decided to build a second generation chip. I will also briefly outline the key ideas of our first chip. So far, embedded applications have had a hard time exploiting task-level parallelism, which is commonly found in DSP and multimedia applications. Thus, an ideal application, an ideal platform that is a multi-core chip, which is fully programmable as well as reconfigurable, can exploit high levels of energy efficiency and performance if we were to exploit this task-level parallelism. To show an example, we see a block diagram shown in the slide here. It consists of a multitude of tasks, some of which, actually most of which, are quite simple. 
This block diagram is an 802.11a Wi-Fi baseband receiver and is commonly found it, as a, and it has common traits found in many applications. Thus, we have decided to build an asynchronous array of simple processors, our first platform, which explored the key ideas of programmable, small, simple, fine-grained cores tiled over a 2D mesh. Each processor contained small local memories, which were sufficient for the simple tasks that we're trying to target. These tasks only require a small programmable core. And because they only, access, they only need access to small data sets, we can see that small IMEM and DMEM, instruction and data memories, are sufficient enough for these types of work. The other benefit of this array is that it is tiled on a Gauss architecture. This allows us to finely tune the frequency of each core and reduce overall power consumption. Each core has additional ability to halt due to its local clock oscillator, which provides it with its independent frequency. So whenever the process is idle, we can shut down the core, effectively clock gating it. Since it's tile over 2D mesh, we decided to use a circuit switch network architecture for its reconfigurable nature. This allows us to have high throughput of one word per clock cycle due to the fact that we use source synchronous communication. Compare and contrast this with clockless asynchronous styles. Because of its circuit switch nature, it also has a low area overhead. And we can easily scale the array to any 2D mesh. So its Gauss nature, its reconfigurability, and its small programmable fine-grained cores allows it to be tolerant to process variations. A 36 processor fully functional chip was fabricated on 0.18 micron technology. Each processor could run up to 610 megahertz at a two volt supply, and each processor only consumed a 0.66 millimeter squared area. Now, although ASAP proved to be an efficient platform for DSP work, we see that upcoming applications tend to be more complex. Thus, we designed our second generation platform to address these type of issues. I'll go over the main challenges we, meet to, we need to overcome with this platform, as well as its individual processors, shared memory, its on-chip intercon interconnection communication scheme, and its per-processor dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, which allows it to attain high energy efficiencies. So we would like this new platform to adopt the key ideas of ASAP, yet in addition, we employ optimal voltage scaling. Thus, we reduce our participation on lightly loaded processors by lowering the VDD, as well as power gate unused processors in order to reduce its leakage. Furthermore, we would like to achieve higher efficiencies for demanding, computationally demanding tasks, such as FFT, video motion estimation, and Viterbi decoding algorithms, due to the fact that simple processing cores do not do well when trying to, trying to implement these type of algorithms. Third, we would like to have larger area efficient on-chip memories. This is because some tasks require a larger set of data to be shared among them, which our small simple firing cores with their local memories do not allow. And lastly, we would like to have an efficient low area overhead for long distance communication to improve the flexibility of our architecture when mapping more complex applications. So our 167 processor computational platform achieves this by containing 164 homogeneous programmable processors. And at the same time, it includes three dedicated purpose processors, which implement the FFT, video the Turby decoding algorithm, and motion estimation algorithm. Alongside the bottom, is also three 16 kilobyte shared memories. And finally, each programmable processor has two distinct features. The first is long distance communication, as I've alluded to you before, as well as per processor dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, allowing us to have even higher energy efficiencies through the scaling of voltage, not only the scaling of frequency. So we take one of the key ideas from the first chip 
by noticing that all tasks are quite simple and only require a small set of data, a small memory for its simple data set, that since it only needs a simple set of data, a smaller set of data. Okay. So each processor only contains an in-order single-issue six-stage pipeline with a 16-bit data path and a one multiply unit, a one 16 by 16 multiply unit with a 40-bit accumulator. And, in and furthermore, to reduce area, we only include 128-word data memory and a 128-word instruction memory. Remember, our programs are very small, so we can fit this in a 128-word instruction memory. We include two 64-word FIFOs for dual clock FIFOs for interprocessor communication over different frequency domains. And finally, this pipeline can execute over 60 basic instructions and features, giving the programmer full flexibility. Although these programming processors do well on the simple tasks, we need special dedicated processors for the harder to get algorithms. The first of which is a fast Fourier transformer algorithm. Now before I continue, each of our dedicated purpose processors includes a local FIFO and clock oscillator. This allows it to be fully integrated with our pre-existing Gauss array. The fast Fourier transformer is used in many applications for signal processing. Thus it can do OFDM modulation, spectral analysis and synthesis. Our particular processor is configurable to run from at runtime to run to analyze 16 to 4,000 point FFT and IFFT complex transforms. It occupies a 0.01 millimeter squared area and preliminary results show that at 866 megahertz, it runs about 34.97 milliwatts at a 1.3 volt supply. Now our continuous flow architecture, the continuous flow architecture of this processor allows it to run at high throughputs. So with this clock rate, we can see that if it analyzed 1,000 point complex FFTs, it can achieve a throughput of 681 million complex samples per second. The second special dedicated purpose processor implements the Viterbi decoding algorithm. The Viterbi is a fundamental building block of many wired wireless communication applications, such as the A02.8 receiver. It can decode codes up to constraint length 10 with 32 different rates. And it occupies the same area as one homogeneous programmable processor, which is 0.17 millimeters squared. So our initial results show that it can run up to nearly 900 megahertz while dissipating 17.55 milliwatts at a 1.3 volt supply. At this rate, clock rate, we can achieve a throughput of 82 megabits per second at a rate of one half. The last special dedicated purpose processor is our motion estimation processor, which is used for video encoding, such as the H.264 and MPEG-2 standards, and, and our particular processor supports a number of fixed and programmable search patterns, including all the H.264 specified block sizes within a 48 by 48 search range. This, is, this processor occupies a 0.67 millimeter squared area and preliminary results show that at 938 megahertz, we dissipate 196.17 milliwatts at a 1.3 volt supply. Now at this clock rate, we can see that it can support 1080p HDTV at 30 frames per second, while running a throughput of 15 billion sums of absolute differences per second. Besides the special dedicated processors and our homogeneous programmable processors, we include three shared memories. Each memory can connect to up to four processors. For our architecture, we have only decided to take advantage of two of these ports. Each shared memory supports port priority, request arbitration, and, is, and has a programmable address generator to support different addressing modes. It also includes a 16 kilobyte single port SRAM for a throughput of one read or write per second, per cycle. It occupies an area equivalent to two homogeneous programmable processors, a 0.34 millimeter squared area. And our initial results show that it's one of the fastest things on our chip. It up, runs up to 1.3 gigahertz, dissipating 4.55 milliwatts at a 1.3 volt supply. 
thus attaining a peak throughput of 20.8 gigabits per second. Although each of the shared memories and dedicated purpose processors could communicate on the Gauss array, the homogeneous programmable processor has the distinct advantage of being able to communicate over longer distances. This is made, this is made possible through our circuit switch source synchronous communication network architecture. Each processor tile contains eight input links as well as eight output links. Each of these source synchronous links contains one clock, one data bus, and one valid and request signals for flow control. Each processor core is, can control, can communicate, write to eight of the possible outputs through software configuration and can read from any two out of the eight using configurable circuit switch hardware. Long distance communication can occur across tiles without interfering with the execution of our local core. Also, because all our communication units are statically configured before runtime, there is no issue with links interfering with other links during communication. One thing to note is that we can also communicate across different frequencies and voltage domains due to the fact that the communication units do not care about the local frequency and voltage of the processing core itself. Furthermore, long distance links can be pipelined. So we can pipeline here or here or here based on user requirements, frequency, latency, or the limitations of the overall system. The second major feature is the per processor dynamic voltage and clock frequency scaling capabilities that we have put into our chip. Each processor is able to operate to a frequency up to the maximum allowable at a particular voltage. The DDFS controller can control this frequency based on the load conditions of the core or by through user configuration. I'll discuss this momentarily. It can halt, restart, and change the oscillator's frequency arbitrarily based on these parameters, however. We can also control the voltage of the core by since we supply the, the overall processor with two different voltages using our, using our power grids, VD high and VD low can be chosen by using two PMOS power gates. We can also choose to disconnect the power gates altogether in order to eliminate, well, virtually eliminate leakage. Each power gate comprises of 48 individually controllable transistors. This allows us to shape the way we change between the two voltages then this might be beneficial for several reasons, which I will discuss later on too. Finally, the DVFS controller and our communication unit is powered by a VDD always on grid, allowing them to be isolated from the core. So the DVFS controller is high, a highly configurable unit. We, the user can set the voltage and frequency statically before runtime. This is very useful for tasks that have a very static load during runtime. Now, many of our DSP applications actually do have tasks that maintain their behavior throughout runtime and can find out the optimal voltage frequency it should run at. Second, the user could also use software to change the voltage and frequency. This is beneficial for the case where a task has a dynamic yet predictable way, predictable load behavior during runtime. Lastly, the user could take a hands-off approach and let the hardware decide what's the optimal voltage and frequency. Two parameters are used for this purpose. The first one is FIFO fullness or utilization. For example, if a core had a very full FIFO, we would try to like to have it to run faster and raise its voltage in such a case. However, if it's nearly empty, we should lower its voltage and frequency since there's practically, there's rarely any data for it to be, keep it busy anyway. This, for, this signal is time filter using an FIR or IR filter in order to reduce unnecessary voltage switching. Voltage switching is bad for two reasons. It creates noise on the global power grids. It also increases overall power consumption if done too frequently. 
And lastly, because our processor must stall during a switch, we see lower performance benefits if we keep on doing the switch. The second parameter is stall frequency, which the DVFS controller can also use to decide whether to lower the frequency and voltage of our processing core. The processor stall signal, if left high, is an indicator of the idleness of the processor. So if we use a counter to count how many cycles this signal has been left high, and it reaches a certain threshold, we can lower the voltage and frequency. The next two slides show measurement results we've taken during an actual switch. In this case, we employ slow switching between a VD low and VD high power grid on a VD core for one processor. The slow switch results in negligible power noise on the VD high and VD low power grids. However, because we keep the processor running during the switch, we see that it consumes leakage. I mean, well, it consumes current large enough to cause a voltage drop, drop on, the, on the VD core grid. We can eliminate this by stalling the clock. The processor will then stall, or actually halt, operation, and only leakage can cause a voltage drop. And because we're on a low leakage process, we barely see any noticeable drop at all. So I'll end the talk by, by giving an analysis and summary of our chip and give you, show you about two examples of real life, real world applications that we have implemented. Our chip contains the 164 programmable processors as well as the FFT, Viterbi, motion estimation, and, six, and three 16 kilobyte shared memories I've discussed before on a nearly 40 millimeter squared die area. It consumes about 55 million transistors on a 65 nanometer ST microelectronics low leakage CMOS process. And a single tile of a, one single tile of the homogeneous programmable processor consumes about 325,000 transistors on a 0.17 millimeter squared area. Running at nearly 1.2 gigahertz at 1.3 uh, volt supply, it dissipates about 59 milliwatts while running 100% active. Well, if we scale the voltage to about 675 milliwatts, millivolts, we consume approximately 600 microwatts while running up to a max frequency of 66 megahertz. A typical application might see it dissipate about 16 milliwatt per processor. In this case, we ha have shown an 802.11a receiver application running at 590 megahertz at a 1.3 volt supply. Now notice that we can fit six processors on a one millimeter squared area. This will illustrate how small our cores really are if we scale up our processors to a nearly 400 millimeter squared area. If we look back at the Intel 4004 4-bit CPU it built in 1971, which utilizes about 2,300 transistors, this scaled-up die would contain about 2,300 of our processors. Thus, to take advantage of these processors, we must focus ourselves on simplified programming and trying to access large common data sets and reduce our focus on load balancing or worrying about wasting processors for data storage and routing. The H.264 CAV LC encoder is one of our first applications we have done with this new parallel processing paradigm. CAV LC stands for Context Adaptive Variable Length Coding, which is used in the H.264 baseline encoder. Our implementation consists of 15 processors and one shared memory. If we break each of these if we break up the encoder, the CAVLC encoder, into its constituent tasks and put them in a mapping tool, one possible mapping is shown at the bottom here. This implementation satisfies the 720p HDTV th standard at 30 frames per second and is shown to be at least 6. Point, at most 6.15 times faster than a TIC62X and an ADSP BF561 processor implementations. The 802.11a baseband receiver is our second, second application we have done on this, on this platform. It includes 22 processors plus one Viterbi and one FFT special dedicated processor. I have to stress that this implementation 
is a complete one because it includes frame detection and synchronization, as well as carrier frequency offset estimation and compensation and channel equalization. This implementation achieves a 54 megabit per second throughput while running at 590 megahertz on all the cores at 1.3 volts, dissipating about 342 milliwatts. This is 23 times faster than a TIC62X implementation, five times faster than a strong arm implementation, and two times faster than a SOTA software-defined radio platform implementation. Now, if we have seen how we, if we see that two or more of our, well, actually any arbitrary number of our processors it turns out to be defective after fabrication, we can use our mapping tool to remap around these defective processors. This shows how reconfigurable our architecture really is and promotes self-enhancing yield enhancement architectures and self-healing methods. So in summary, all the processors in shared memory contain independent clock oscillators allowing us to achieve a GALS, a complete GALS architecture. It also has 164 homogeneous processors that could run up to 1.2 gigahertz while dissipating nearly 60 milliwatts and contains three 16 kilobyte shared memories, three dedicated burst processors, long distance circuit switch communication, and DVFS, which in simulation sees 48% reduction in energy for only an 8% performance loss for a JPEG application. Okay, we would like to acknowledge these contributors. Um, well, thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, excuse me, what's the delay to reload the code to each processor? About a few microseconds at this point, due to the fact that we only do a serial communication when reloading. But I mean, this easily can be sped up much, much faster. And we also have a limitation due to the fact that we didn't use USB. We actually did use a simple UART, I think, serial communication, SPI, mostly. I see. Thank you. Thanks. OK, my name is Alex Bachmus, Chief Architect from Nokia Siemens Networks. I have actually a few, pro few questions for you. Uh, one question, uh, since your architecture is based on tiles, mm -hmm. have you compared your chip with uh, another chip that uh, we know based on tiles is Tilera? Yeah. So one of, the pro one of the things that we do differently is we do GALS architecture. That's one of the main things. And we are trying to target applications that can be easily broken up into those small tasks I was mentioning about that could fit into simple processing cores. So because we can do such fine grain uh, task parallelization, we achieve higher energy efficiencies due to that fact. And Tyler and, well, they use an OS and they target more general purpose, I think, processors, um, applications. Okay. Uh, the second question is, uh, as with uh, other uh, tile architecture, uh, the communication potentially becomes the bottleneck because one communication unit has to take at least four other uh, uh, directions to get, let's say, down to the same destination. So that, how do you solve that problem? I haven't seen any FIFOs, any uh, uh, burst uh, management, any QoS, or anything that is related to communication uh, bottlenecks. So our, since we use source synchronous communication, we can achieve high throughput one word per second, but we don't consider about latency. At this point, we, we haven't considered that problem because most of our applications are throughput constrained, not latency constrained. But yeah, real-time applications will have to consider different architectural approaches to take, to take this into account. But we can achieve a one word per cycle and it'll get, it'll get there because we have circuit switch and we don't need to worry about contentions or anything like that. Yeah, that is the same mm -hmm. with Tyler, but the problem is that it is bottleneck. Mm -hmm. Because even in one cycle, you can get four requests at the same time. Okay. Yeah, so you need to somehow handle all those fours. So at the software end, yeah, we'll have to like, the can only read two FIFOs. Thus, if one comes in first, we'll have to read that one first. And the software designer can use actually branch instructions. So if the FIFO, one FIFO is currently empty, then we could switch to read the next FIFO. Or if it's full, then we could say, okay, speed up. So the software pro programmer can choose to try to fix this issue. But yeah, something we haven't really fully explored at this point. 
Okay, and the third question, I think you partially actually answered them and it's related to the latency. One of the biggest problem of such uh, tile architecture is that actually latency from core to specific destination actually differs between cores. So in some cases latency can be one clock and some latencies can be whatever, 15 mm -hmm. or 20 clocks, depends on the distance, uh, what you have. And then you have software uh, management problem uh, what piece of software runs on which core if your application becomes uh, actually latency uh, sensitive it's, it's it's actually predictability because in this case you just don't have latency predictability it really depends where your software code is running I think for the s applications we have like looked at this is not a problem and yeah I will take your um, take your <laughs> ideas and advisement but uh, I can't really say about like what processors have to be mapped in certain ways due to this contention facts and our mapping tool itself does not really consider latency as one of its criteria so cannot really answer that at this point. Okay, thank sorry. you. Okay, I'm sorry we are running a little late so can we please take that question offline? Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So our next speaker is from uh, Philips Semiconductor. Yes, we used to be Philips. Yeah, NX Yeah, yeah. And um, he graduated from Andover uh, University of Technology and is now and then joined Philips Research. Defined, helped define many high-end TV signal processing functions, and now responsible for architecture definitions for video innovations at Nexperia. How do I switch this on? Should be on. Hello? No, that's the next one. Next one. Just use that. Hello? Just keep Which talking, he'll pull you up. Okay. All right, um, my name is Johan Janssen. Thanks for the introduction. I work for NXP Semiconductors. Um, NXP is actually a company that spun off about two years ago from Philips Electronics. And since two years, we are kind of a startup. Uh, we are active in various semiconductors markets. And uh, the talk that I will be giving today is about the consumer market where we have positioned products uh, in the TV domain. <coughs> so basically, what I will be discussing is a high performance full HD 120 Hertz post processing engine where we have to solve, I guess, a number of different constraints that I've heard in the previous talks. In this market, it's all about cost. So cost of, uh, of the system solutions that we actually can offer our set makers. It's all about power consumption of the chip. And for these specific markets, it's all about picture quality, uh, which is the enabler basically for, uh, for these products and actually going to the market with those. So I will briefly uh, start by explaining uh, why is there actually a market for frame rate conversion? Because that is basically what this chip does. It does frame rate conversion and nothing else. And still we can actually sell that to our uh, OEM set makers who, who put that in the TVs. Uh, I will discuss then the chip itself, the 5100, the PNX 5100, both from a system point of view, also from a SOC point of view. And I will say a little bit about the video subsystem that we have in this product. Then I will switch to three different features that uh, basically have enabled this product. The first one is the application itself. And I will want to say a little bit about how we tackled that one, which is the frame rate conversion. The second one is the, basically the computing engine, the heart of the product that does all the number crunching, number crunching to enable this functionality which is the Trimedia 3271 media processor. And thirdly, I will discuss briefly a technology which we call on-the-fly compression of uh, video traffic to and from SD-RAM actually to enable or to reduce that bottleneck that we have there. Then I will quickly say something about the product status. Where is the product now? And uh, finally, I will conclude with some lessons that we learned and also what is ahead of us uh, basically in the market. So let me spend one slide on frame rate conversion. Uh, why is frame rate conversion relevant in a TV? Uh, there are basically two reasons at this moment in time. The first one is that the content that we receive in our TV can be either video or film. 
And what we see typically for film content is that it is shot at 24 hertz, but then displayed on your TV at 60 hertz by means of a, what we call pull-down uh, technology, uh, which is basically just repeating pictures twice or three times, uh, depending on, uh, yeah, on what the frame rate of the input is. Of course, if this is displayed on your TV and it starts moving, you will see judder. And this judder becomes more pronounced once the display size gets bigger. Uh, and basically frame rate conversion, so motion, motion compensated frame rate conversion tries to estimate, uh, let's say on a pixel by pixel base, the motion and uh, interpolates the missing frames to get rid of that uh, movie judder. That's one reason uh, why these frame rate converters were in the market uh, traditionally. A second reason is basically um, since TVs have moved to LCDs, LCD displays mostly these days, there is another reason to uh, want to deploy frame rate conversion. Uh, as you might know, LCD displays are so-called sample and hold displays. And what that basically means is that uh, the pixels, the light that you actually see coming out of the LSD is typically frozen for the duration of the frame. And what that actually boils down to is once it starts moving, uh, you will actually see sharp images become much more blurred. And that's what we call motion blur. Uh, you can, I think if you have a larger display, this, this is very pronounced, uh, pronounced visible. Also for that one, basically you can reduce that motion blur significantly by going to higher frame rates. And what you see in the market these days already is that many HD TVs are offering so-called 120 hertz uh, 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 frame rate solutions where the in, where the missing pictures basically are interpolated by, again, a frame rate conversion converter that operates in a motion compensated way. So basically, uh, two reasons why frame rate conversion by itself can be differentiating and why it's interesting for our customers to have that in their TVs. Um, briefly, something about NXP and picture quality. Like I already said, uh, we have a long history in this domain as being having been part of Philips Electronics. We have put these kind of products already on the market for I think over 10 years. And as a semiconductors company, we have been able to actually take all that technology on board and uh, deploying that towards the broader market. So how does a TV system look like these days basically? So if you look at uh, the left hand side here, basically a whole TV solution, uh, what I call a hybrid TV solution is encapsulated in one single chip already now, except for maybe the channel decode, which we still leave outside, although we are integrating at this moment also. These chips basically take care of the full HD, H ATSC decode, uh, DVB decode, which is H.264. It does all the rendering, also in HD, like the deinterlacing, the, the scaling, the picture enhancement features like sharpening, noise reduction, white color gamut, you name it. Uh, it will do the audio processing, it will do OSD and graphics, so it will have all the overlays uh, composited in these solutions and it has the right interfaces to actually make it a full-fledged TV solution, like the HDMI inputs and the, uh, the LVDS outputs. This market, like I said, is extremely cost competitive, so for that reason we have chosen in this time basically to still keep the additional functionality which uplifts your basic uh, chipset to a full-fledged 120 hertz solution to keep that separate for now. Uh, the main reason of doing that is basically cost, although in our roadmaps and product portfolios that we are building today, we are integrating that function as well. So it will, in the end it will be a full-fledged, fully integrated 120 hertz solution. For now it's outside because of memory bandwidth constraints, because of cost constraints, and because basically the LCD market is migrating towards 120 hertz and that is just starting. That has not captured, let's say, 90% of the market. So <clears throat> let's take a look at this PNX5100. So let's take a look at the SOC view of this one. Basically the, the heart of this uh, chip is what we call the computing system, which consists of three extremely powerful media processors. So that's the Trimedia 3271, which are processors and architectures that we actually own in-house, which perform, uh, two of them actually perform the full frame rate conversion functionality in software. 
Next to that, there is a, let's say, a video processing and rendering part, which you would see on this side, which embeds in more dedicated hardware, the more traditional functions like scaling, uh, sharpening, and, and the ones I mentioned before. From a memory point of view, this chip has a DDR2-667 32-bit interface that we can basically um, scale down to actually use with one 16-bit memory for the lower uh, performance requiring markets or with two 16-bit memories if we want to have it running in the full-fledged uh, picture quality and performance modes. From a video interfacing point of view, there is basically at the input the LVDS, the dual LVDS interface to capture 1080p. That is an interface that is typically used between uh, the TV socks and the panel, the panel processor itself, the TCON but in this case also between the mainstream SOC and of course these picture post processors. At the output, because we're dealing with 120 Hz there, that interface is doubled. So it's basically a quadruple LVDS transmitter that uh, sends the pixels directly into the LCD panel. Uh, next to that there are a number of peripherals, for example PS PCI to, uh, uh, to enable boot, to send over graphics or OSD if you want to do that separately next to your video. I2C, EJTAG, uh, UARTs, and some GPIOs. So that gives you an idea on um, what's on this chip. If we look at uh, basically a layout picture of this same chip, you can see the three trimedia processors here on the left-hand side. You can see the whole DDR interface here on the right-hand side. And you basically see the rest of it, which is just the more traditional video processing and the, the digital parts of the IPs, uh, basically here on the top and the bottom in the middle. This chip was built uh, using a CMOS 90 LP process. It is in its, let's say, highest configuration placed in a BGA 456 package, a four layer package. And the core power consumption when it's actually running at its highest performance level is about four and a half watt. Um, the power constraints actually were, were an important design criterion for this chip as we do not want to have uh, heat sinks or other active power or uh, cooling, uh, reduction, cooling uh, systems on these chips. Uh, again, the package that we need to choose for these kind of products need to be extremely cost, uh, cost sensitive, otherwise we will not be able to be differentiating from that point of view in the market and we will never sell the product. Okay, so let me zoom into uh, the video subsystem. Like I already mentioned, there are basically two of the three media processors, the tri-media processors, take care of the full frame rate conversion. And you have to realize here that we're basically processing or outputting 1920 by 1080 progressive at 120 hertz. So you're talking about a 300 megapixel throughput rate that you need to get through your system. One of those tri-medias is fully dedicated to the motion estimation and uh, our proprietary motion vector processing in order to actually improve the picture quality. And the other trimedia is fully dedicated on the actual interpolation and calculating the missing pictures that you do not have. And realize here that if you receive, for example, film content, which enters your system at 24 hertz, you actually have to interpolate 96 pictures per second to come to the 120 hertz. And uh, that is both challenging on a performance side as well as on the picture quality side because four of the five pictures that you actually see on the display are not originals, they have been interpolated. So we have to be extremely careful on the picture quality for this one. The third trimedia is basically on one hand put in there to have still some headroom and to still allow additional featuring on this product which we're actually deploying in the market today with advanced backlight dimming technologies, for example. But also, it takes care of the whole control of the system, and it does what we call the auto picture control. And that is basically a smart function that collects all kinds of measurements from the pictures, every picture, like noise and sharpness and color and contrast, and basically uses that input to set all the functions that we have, the video functions optimally, for a picture, from a picture quality point of view. Okay, so I want to switch now to the three topics that I earlier introduced. So the first one is 
this frame rate converter and how we actually we do these uh, applications. Then I will say something about the uh, Trimedia processor and then lastly about video compression. So frame rate conversion typically consists of on one hand motion estimation and on the other hand uh, interpolation, so calculating missing pictures. And motion, traditional motion estimators, what they try to do is they try to find a match between a block of pic pixels, basically between a current picture and a previous picture. So let's say if you look at this building, it will find a match in that building, uh, basically between this picture and this picture. Normally, if not too much is going on in your, in your, in your content, this, this is fine. However, in more complex scenes, you are dealing with what we call the covering and uncovering problem. Basically, if you look at this area here, you want to find a match between this square of pixels and something that is covered here. So this two-frame motion estimator will never be able to find the correct motion here. And that is something that uh, in, in the traditional solutions that you see on the market and also what we used to have on, on the market leads to an annoying artifact, which you basically see around this helicopter here. That is what we call a halo artifact, and that is the result of not being able to estimate the motion correctly in these occluded areas. And then the interpolator does not know what to do, and it fetches the wrong pixels, and then basically uh, you get artifacts like these. In our solution that we bring to the market, so this PNX 5100, we have solved this issue to the largest extent, where we basically do not just estimate between a current and a previous picture, but we also estimate between a current and a next picture. Of course, this increases the performance that you need from your system significantly, but it allows you to basically to either find a match in all three pictures, or to find a match between the current and the previous one, like here, or find a match between the current and the next picture, like here. Well, the way I actually am explaining it now seems quite simple, but trust me, uh, it is not trivial to actually determine whether you have found a match between those two or whether you have found a match between those two. So that by itself, uh, doing that well, is, is a technology by itself. Um, if you then basically look at the results of such a three-frame um, motion estimator and the interpolation that comes out of that versus a two-frame motion estimator, I hope you can see that the halo artifact that you still see on this side here is largely gone. And for us, uh, a silicon vendor's picture quality in a TV market, actually to, a, to enable us to sell it in the market, picture quality has to be good, otherwise our customers will not sell it. And this is one feature that has enabled us to actually sell this product in the market. Okay, so let's look at a different perspective on uh, effectively deploying programmability. I mean, one, th one thing that, that needs to be a given, of course, is that the, the computing platform that you use to do these kind of uh, functions on has to be competitive. Uh, otherwise, you will never be able to, to actually run it on that or ne never be able to sell it because of the cost competitiveness of this market. So I think for our Trimedia architectures, that is a given. We have also done extensive benchmarks already, uh, uh, basically looking at our technology compared to what our uh, competitors have to offer or other vendors have to offer or more general purpose processors. Another reason why we think programmability is a differentiator also for us uh, in this market is because we have been enabled to continue the innovation, basically the, the on the application side, throughout the whole SOC development, as well as way into the design-ins with our customers. Uh, in one hand, basically to, to mature the function further, on the other hand, to actually work with the customer and customize the function further. So that has proven to be a big plus for this product. Lastly, and that is basically what you see on this slide here, um, if you look at such a temporal up converter, basically the interpolator, depending on the local content that the estimator finds or, or the local uh, characteristics of your content, you have to do interpolation differently. So there is quite a big difference in the complexity of these types of interpolators. And the way we have to approach that is we actually have analyzed how much of the high complex um, processing is required in, in really critical and worst case uh, video content. And from that we have actually concluded that that is mostly much less than 50% 
but worst case about 50%. And that has allowed us to actually give resources, more resources or more compute resources to areas of the picture that need it and take away resources from area of the pictures that don't need it. And in fact, that meant that we could actually build our system at a much lower cost. Otherwise, we would have needed to dimension that for the worst case always, and the, the SOC would, be, would have been much more expensive. So this is an additional nice thing that our programmable architecture has, uh, has given us. OK, so let's take a brief look at this, uh, this Trimedia processor. Uh, I will only spend little time on this since this processor has been discussed at this conference already, I think, two years ago, or at least the predecessor of this one. The TM3271 is a fully synthesizable design, and in our C90 LP process, it runs, let's say, somewhere between 350 and 450, depending on the market that we want to address and the power that we want to consume with that product. It's a five-issue five slot VLI double machine. In this configuration, we have uh, given it a 32 kilobyte instruction cache and a 64 kilobyte data cache. And we have given it certain application specific operations or functional units to increase the performance basically of this processor further, uh, basically for the function that we, uh, that we are targeting. So this processor itself in CMOS 90 is about six square millimeters. So it gives you an idea, calculating back on the SOC, how, how big this SOC is going to be. And it also gives you an idea, if you basically look at all these numbers here that we need uh, to run this function, actually what the cost of this frame rate converter is. And I think that is a nice comparison that, that we internally have done with our own pre predecessors and what our competitors are putting into the market. And what you basically can conclude here that is, if you add all the functions like the motion estimation, the advanced vector processing, the interpolation, and the film detection or cadence detection, basically this whole function runs at below two, two of those processors, which is about 10 square millimeters CMOS 90 for this function. I think that is extremely competitive. We have also done benchmarks uh, internally uh, because we keep getting these questions. Eh? So how does this compare to general purpose CPUs? Uh, and we have done some benchmarks of mapping some of these functions on, for example, Pentium processors, and then the same function runs at order magnitude tens of gigahertz that you need. So th that gives you an idea on the basically capabilities of this uh, subsystem that we are using for frame rate conversion and how that would translate to uh, more general purpose implementations. Okay, so let me briefly say something about um, video compression. When we were making this product, um, we were targeting a DDR2667 32-bit interface. And at that moment uh, in time, the CMOS 90 LP process that we were targeting actually gave us some risk of actually achieving that speed. So we have looked at all kinds of alternatives for, for, for basically reducing that design risk, like going to another memory interface, going to a wider memory interface, licensing, uh, uh, memory controller and fire technologies to actually enable higher speeds. In the end, we came up with something which was much simpler, basically using our own in-house video compression technology, which is able to compress fixed chunks of video data of, let's say, 128 pixel elements into something smaller on the fly in a visually lossless way, so you won't see the difference, before sending it to the background memory and doing the opposite, of course, while retrieving it from the SDRAM. And that by itself actually has mellowed that design constraint for us significantly, uh, which basically meant that we would not have needed a, a 667 a speed DDR2, but could got, have gotten away with a lower speed. Well, in the end, we were able to actually achieve the speed target. So from that perspective, it was actually reducing the risk, or now we can actually use it to increase the performance further if you would desire so. I will skip this discussion. So if you then look basically at um, what that means from a user's case point of view, the discussion I just tried to explain. So for a 333 megahertz, so 667 DDR2 interface, the bandwidth that the whole system in its largest configuration would consume would be about 81%. 
So there is gross bandwidth taking into account everything, also the inefficiencies of the transactions. So the, the, the gross DDR speed would be utilized for 81%. We, we consider this to be safe. So if we can uh, assure this in the system, then the system will work. But at that moment in time, we did know, not know yet whether we could actually read this, reach this speed or this speed. And then for 300 megahertz, it actually would jump up by another 10%. And then basically that we, 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 we pass that risk threshold because 90% is a risk. So it might mean that some of the use cases will not work anymore. And with this video compression enabled, only on a few uh, uh, data points that go to memory and come from memory, we actually achieved something which is below that comfortability threshold again. Okay, so the IP itself, uh, let's talk briefly about latency and throughput, um, has about 80 cycles of additional latency for the encoder before you ship it to memory, and it adds about 60 cycles of latency for the decoder. Since we are using this decoder and encoder only in, in, in basically the, the, the IPs that use straightforward processing, li typical li video line-based processing, this latency was not an issue at all. Furthermore, the throughput of this uh, IP is about one pixel per cycle. Okay, so let me briefly switch to where are we with this product now. Basically, the silicon, we got the silicon almost a year ago already. So if, from where I'm standing, I, I was the system architect of this product. This is an old product for me. I'm working on, on something else now. And I would love to share that with you, by the way, but unfortunately I can't. Um, but I mean, one of... I think the, the, the really impressive things that happened here is that we got silicon a year ago and two weeks later we actually showed this whole application with all the software at the IFA, which is a huge consumer show in, uh, in Germany, in Berlin. One of the two I think we have every year, one in Las Vegas and one there. So, and that was the enabler actually for engaging with a lot of customers that, that have chosen us now uh, in the market. So we, we have this product in the market now, mass production with various customers, and we get very good feedback on, uh, on the picture quality. Then my last slide. There are of course some lessons that we learned out of this. The major, one of the major design challenges for us has appeared to be communication to SDRAM, rather than computation that we have on the chip. I think we, we really comfortably manage that part but the communication to SDRAM and also the predictability of the bandwidth that we have to and from the background memory has, has been a major design, um, well, constraint or challenge, I would say, for that product. Also has given us the input that in our next generation uh, architecture subsystems, of course, again, based on the Trimedia, memory bandwidth predictability has become a design constraint. That basically means that we have improved further on the caching strategies in these processors and enabled in such a way that we have full predictability of uh, the amount of bandwidth that we need from the background memory. Another thing which appeared to be extremely positive uh, uh, from this product is that we have been able to innovate along the SOC development uh, even into the design in, like I already said. So that, that is a big plus. If we had not done that, if this would have been a dedicated solution, then we uh, would have needed to have different spins of the, of the silicon, which we didn't in this case. So the silicon only saw tape out once with maybe one metal fix. If you look outwards, so basically towards the future, our customers are now um, asking even further uh, improvements on the, on the frame rate. So let's say from the 120 to the 240 to even further increase or improve the motion blur reduction. Uh, also, Quad Full HD is coming to the market, so that's much more resolution. Pixel resolutions are going up from 10-bit, as this product basically supports, to 16-bit, once we will actually have full high dynamic range content coming in our living room. And of course, there is the continuing innovation of, of these algorithms themselves. So adding that all up, we're talking about a factor 8 to 16 complexity increase, or performance increase that we are dealing with. And besides that, our cells Besides working on these kind of things, are of course integrating all this functionality in the mainstream socks at the same price, of course. The price of the chip cannot go up. Thank you. Again, just a couple of questions. 
the the block based motion complexes please introduce yourself if you oh okay i'm i'm karthik from inter um the the block based uh, motion compensation uh technique that you use uh typically have issues with the, around the edge pixels right where it doesn't give the true motion um well what i try to explain before if if the edge pixels are just static or part of an object they don't give any issues at all but if the edge uh, pixels maybe that's what you mean are part of something that is moving on top of on top of something else you traditionally have issues there and that's basically that occlusion problem that i explained in the beginning and we solve that by means of being able to identify the motion or classify the motion either towards a previous or a next picture and interpolate then very efficiently or extrapolate if you don't have the correct data right i'm not talking about the occlusion itself it, if if the edge is moving uh, across the picture no we have no issues with that no issues with that no. okay and uh, the other question i had was um, it, so the, the the programmability aspect of this right is yeah. primarily for your internal development or or do you, do you are you planning on releasing any firmware patches later or? well the uh, uh, it's a number of things i also try to explain that and one thing is that we that we really believe that this architecture template is very cost competitive and differentiating even in this market compared to what we could license in or compared to even dedicated hardware so from that perspective to have something that is programmable is a benefit yes we have firmware upgrades uh, towards our designers to our oem customers that give them basically very late in their design cycle just before they go to the market with these products the latest and greatest quality next question hi uh, this is Sean I got a couple questions for you and one is about the motion estimation so could you tell a little bit about the maximum search range for the motion estimation engine in the three frame search mode Okay, so, the block size. so what we basically have done on this product, uh, we, can, we can keep a certain amount of search range on the chip in, in basically the data cache of the Trimedia processors. If we stay within that, we have a predictable behavior towards the memory bandwidth. That gives you a search range of, I would say horizontally, a couple of hundred pixels and vertically a hundred. If we want to go beyond that, we start coming into an area that we have a trade-off between uh, basically how much search range we want to add and what that does to the, uh, to the bandwidth that the system requires. So for our higher end instantiations, where we need the full fledged uh, memory subsystem up and running, we can go far beyond that even. Okay. So e even in the market, I think we are recognized for having uh, the best in class search range uh, tracking capabilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, what if the motion simulation doesn't find a good match? What do you do with that? Well, we have all kinds of uh, fallback uh, methods to basically make sure that if the content is um, very complex or if the, if the motion estimator indeed finds the wrong vectors, that we go to some fallback methodologies where we basically interpolate less or do not interpolate at some point in time at all anymore. So that basically you start repeating pictures. Okay. And my second question is on the, you have some characterization of the image areas like you have consistent inconsistent yep. static and yep. also uh, yeah a few others mm -hmm. and it seems you architect your your chip based on some certain assumption of the of the percentage of those areas mm -hmm. so and uh, my question is that what if the actual case is worse than that and well, in, in, in real case, I know what you're saying. So, in, in, in real life, the actual case is, 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 is less than this, is what we have found. Um, I mean, it, it's, you can also understand that if you have multiple objects moving, I mean, the part of the image by default that can be occluded as a result of that is limited. You cannot have you cannot have 100% of your uh, content occluded. That does that does not exist. If for some reason we would actually run into problems and we would not be able to run the whole frame rate converter real time. We have a dynamic uh, load balancing mechanism on the chip, which basically starts scaling down the, uh, uh, the algorithms and as such the way we do the interpolation. So we always guarantee throughput and we have never seen actually the content so complex that we cannot deal with, with this. Okay. Okay. And uh, my last question is about the chip size. Could you comment a little bit on that? I gave you one number. You've seen the picture, so you can estimate it, I guess. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, last question. Please keep it brief. If you okay. oh. Koji Sigma Sony Corporation. So, uh, what is the clock frequency? The clock frequency of what? 
of the 5100. Okay, the clock the, frequency of the Trimedia processor? No, 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 the entire chip. No, no, the, the, the chip runs at different clocks. So there are a number of different clock domains in there. Okay. So, so for example, the, the, the video output pipe runs at 300 megahertz. The Trimedia processor, like I explained, runs between 350 and 450, depending on uh, the product in instantiation. Is that what you mean? Okay, okay. okay. it's all right. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Our next and final talk of the session is by Richard Selwagi uh, from AMD. And Richard is principal member of the technical staff of Digital Television Group at AMD. Prior to AMD, he was uh, with, uh, uh, he started as a 2D, 3D graphics architect at Sing Labs, and then one of the first architect at ATI Radeon chip. And he graduated from CMU. We'll need to be turned on here, do you think? Or yeah, you just start. Hello? Yeah. Right, and I need a, uh, the clicker thing. OK, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and it's always fun to uh, follow one of your competitors' presentations immediately. Um, and also, this is not nearly as exciting as um, automatic uh, driving cars. That was really a great presentation. Um, so as Pradeep said, uh, my colleague Larry Perlstein and I work in the digital television group at AMD. And uh, for the past few years, we've been working on uh, panel processor products. And these are products that uh, improve image quality of LCD displays. Um, so today, um, I'm going to be presenting uh, AMD's latest panel processor, the uh, Zillion X420, and I'm going to be describing the uh, media DSP processing technology that goes into building this chip. So as any consumer knows, the uh, big screen TVs have been selling in large numbers for the past five to ten years, and in fact, just this year, uh, LCD TVs have overtaken CRTs uh, in unit shipments. And uh, throughout this time, LCD display technology has made great advances uh, in areas such as uh, wider viewing angle, higher contrast ratio, and so forth. Um, but one of the last remaining problems uh, is that of, of motion blur. Uh, sometimes fast moving objects on LCDs can appear blurry compared to uh, CRT televisions. So this problem of motion blur is actually a very interesting one. Um, it has more to do with the human visual system than it does with the characteristic of the panel. Uh, the blur is not actually on the panel. The blur is on the, uh, the human retina. Uh, if your eye didn't move while you were watching an image, uh, there would be no blur. And so th the reason this happens is, um, is because the LCD is a hold type display, which means that each picture is pasted on the screen for a constant brightness for the full frame time. And the frame time is about 16 milliseconds for 60 hertz video. And uh, while that, uh, if the human's eye is moving while that uh, picture is stable on there, it will end up uh, smearing that image across the viewer's retina. So there are two main pieces of technology that you need to do uh, to reduce motion blur. Uh, the first thing is you need to double the refresh rate. And uh, this means you know, le less time displaying the image is less time for the viewer's eye to move and have that smearing effect. And then the second piece of technology that you need is, of course, the advanced uh, video algorithm that performs the motion compensated frame rate conversion. And uh, as described earlier, the frame rate conversion algorithm, it basically looks at every object that's moving on the screen and uh, determines where it's moving, and it creates an intermediate frame in which uh, each object has moved uh, half the distance. And uh, th this same technology is, of course, used for um, dejuddering of film material also. So this technology is in modern TV sets today. If you go into a modern TV set, take a TV set apart, you'll see that there are two main uh, boards in the TV set, the, the TV motherboard that has your DTV SOC on it, and then a panel board that is located up close to the flat panel itself. Um, our AMD Zillion part resides on this flat panel uh, board, or on the panel board, rather. And uh, it does the frame rate conversion, and it doubles the frame rate. Um, our chip also has the timing controller for the LCD panel integrated into it. 
uh, AMD had a partnership uh, with Samsung, and we've integrated Samsung's uh, timing controller into this chip. And we believe this is the first chip that has uh, integrated these two pieces of technology. And this ends up saving costs because you don't need an external DRAM that would be uh, required by an external TCON. Um, and also, this configuration here saves cost in that cabling, too, that goes between these two boards uh, by keeping that at the lower 60 hertz refresh rate. So taking a look at a block diagram of what's inside our Zillion chip, um, uh, very simply, the, the box in the middle we see in yellow, the memory controller controls the uh, SDRAM. We have a stream manager that manages data coming in, uh, the capture of data coming into the chip and the display of the video data going out. Um, pixel data comes in over a mini LVDS interface and goes out over a, uh, I'm sorry, the pixel data comes in a regular LVDS and goes out over a mini LVDS interface. Um, and you see that we have these two of these media DSP uh, cores here. Uh, each of these cores, they work in parallel on the left and, half, uh, left and right halves of the screen. And, um, and the remainder of my talk is really going to be about this processing technology that we use to build these cores that go into this chip. So uh, in a nutshell, this Media DSP platform, uh, it, it's a flexible media processing platform. And we've designed it to be uh, well suited to address a range of video applications uh, or media applications, but with a focus on video processing especially. Um, and it has features that enable uh, real-time performance. And to date, we've used this technology to build two different families of chips, uh, the first being uh, MPEG-2 AV encoding chips, and then our current generations of um, uh, MCFRC chips. So there are a couple characteristics about MCFRC that uh, made it a, a good fit for our approach with Media DSP. Um, first off, uh, in a mathematical sense, F FRC is what's known as an ill-posed problem. And so this means there's no single optimal solution. And as a result, uh, each customer will uh, tend to have a different preference for how you want to they want to solve that problem. Um, you cannot go and find a published paper that has a perfect solution for FRC. There's no standard for FRC. So this makes programmability important here. Um, and then at full HD rates, FRC uh, requires a, a large amount of computational resources. So Taken together, you really need to have a programmable, uh, a multi-core approach uh, to do this job. So uh, taking a deeper look at video uh, algorithms in general, we've noticed certain classes of operations that appear in all of them. And uh, I'm going to run through them quickly here. So first, you have your highly parallelizable operations. People usually think of this as operating on pixel data. But many times, motion vectors and picture statistics can be operated on in a parallel fashion. So for these types of operations, um, a highly data, data parallel engine, such as a programmable SIMD, or a specialized uh, data path intensive type of engine is a good fit. Um, next up are what we call ad hoc compu computation and decision making type of operations. And uh, for here, a general purpose processor usually does the job. Um, these types of uh, processing operations are usually about um, an order of magnitude uh, less complex than the ones in the previous category. Uh, next up, you have data movement and formatting type of operations. And a lot of times with video, um, you're, you're moving multiple planes of data, such as uh, luminance and chrominance data. So a multidimensional DMA engine that has on-the-fly pixel format conversion is useful to handle these kinds of operations. And then finally, um, there's bit serial processing. And this shows up in the entropy encode and decode portions of uh, video codec applications. And so, and these can easily overwhelm a, a, a risk processor, any general purpose processor. So something like a programmable bit stream processor is really required to hit the kind of bit rates for uh, codec applications. Um, so realizing this diversity of uh, processing, this is what really what led us to a multi-core approach that supports um, heterogeneous application-specific processing elements. So starting up at the uh, conceptual level of our Media DSP platform, um, early on we realized that uh, video algorithm developers tended to uh, capture their work in, um, in a format like a task flow graph, such as I uh, show here. And so this is the kind of uh, programming model that we've used to drive our architecture. You can think of it as a sort of a domain-specific uh, programming environment. 
tailored to video applications. And uh, basically the Media DSP accelerates this uh, flexible pipeline of video tasks. Um, so uh, you don't need to look at all the details in this slide, but you know, just taking a look at the general idea of the programming model, um, this is an example of a task flow graph for an MPEG-2 video macro block encoder. And uh, so once your algorithm is worked out, the programmer will start here and expose the parallelism of his application uh, by using a task flow graph sort of notation. And then the second stage would involve the um, programmer taking this task flow graph and mapping these tasks to the various resources that we have in our platform. Each of these tasks tends to fall into one of those categories I mentioned earlier, the different types of operations. So you map it to the right kind of core for that operation and you do your cycle count analysis and bandwidth analysis at, at this phase of the project and um, to make sure the specific configuration uh, can meet the needs of that application in real time. Um, so before I present a block diagram of the media DSP, I want to define some of the terms uh, that we use. And first is a simple one, a task. A uh, task is something that has a definite initiation time and uh, it runs until completion without interruption. Um, for video applications, tasks can run anywhere from about 500 cycles up to maybe 10,000 cycles, depending on how you've uh, parallelized your application. Um, next is the idea of a task-oriented engine, or TOE. And this is a uh, programmable or fixed function engine whose job is very simple to just execute a task and then, then halt. Um, next is the task control unit, and, or the TCU. And this is a specialized control unit that um, it, it resides in front of every task-oriented engine. And his job is to queue up tasks that are to be issued uh, to that TOE. And he also, uh, more importantly even, synchronizes with the other TCUs and control engines in the system. And the control engines are general purpose risk processors. Uh, their jobs are to uh, orchestrate the tasks for maximum parallelism. You can think of it as um, sort of loading the control flow for that task flow graph into the uh, TCUs of the system. And then on top of that, the control engine can also function uh, as a task-oriented engine itself for the ad hoc type tasks that show up in the uh, task flow graph for the application. Um, and then the, there is a shared memory, which is a wide on-chip memory accessible to all these elements. Um, it mainly holds the data buffers that are produced and consumed uh, by the task-oriented engines in the system. And finally, the communication fabric, which is the interconnect among all of these elements uh, in the media DSP. So uh, now with all these definitions out of the way, we can look at a block diagram of a generic media DSP. This is no specific AMD chip, but uh, you see the basic topology is a uh, multiprocessor system with a shared memory um, with all the engines connected via the backbone. Um, along the top, you have a, a scalable array of these task-oriented engines, with each task-oriented engine having a task control unit between that engine and the communication fabric. And you'll note the DMA engine at the bottom uh, is treated as just another task-oriented engine. Um, and uh, the uh, risk control engine is shown in, in red here. Um, we can have more than one control engine if required. And it has direct connections to the chip level uh, register backbone of an SOC, but more importantly, it has direct connection to the uh, chip level memory backbone, to the S external SD RAM, uh, so that his uh, memory accesses for running programs and so forth do not take up uh, any bandwidth off of that internal communication fabric in the media DSP. Um, and then finally, all the, the state of the processor is accessible from the outside world via the uh, register slave interface unit in the lower right there. So taking that generic picture, now we can look at the specific topology that we have um, put together to accomplish the frame rate conversion task in the X420 chip. Um, along the top, you see we developed uh, six application-specific engines uh, that, that each um, perform a, a subtask in the frame rate conversion algorithm. And then uh, we have 10 instances of this DSP crunch engine. Um, it's a 128-bit data path DSP engine that I'm going to talk about in a little more detail in a couple slides. Um, and then we have four control engines in this system. And uh, the communication fabric uh, in this system is actually made up of a hierarchy of backbone managers uh, with a crossbar bridge between them. And the shared memory is partitioned into four separate blocks of memory, so we can have a 
many parallel accesses going on uh, between the various TOEs and the shared memory. And just remember there, so there's two copies of this block diagram in the Zillion 420 chip. So uh, this table shows how uh, we've been able to use this uh, platform-based approach uh, to create four chips for two very different applications um, using the same basic platform. So in the columns on the right, we have two SD uh, MPEG encoder chips, and we have two frame rate conversion chips. And um, so first off, you can see that we've uh, applied reuse with the, the number of blocks here across all four of these chips. And then the extendability of the platform uh, is demonstrated by how we've been able to um, build application-specific engines in order to tackle these various uh, applications. And then uh, finally, the scalability of the platform uh, just uh, is indicated by how we've been able to replicate certain blocks. So you, you get the idea of how this platform-based approach uh, can be a powerful lever uh, for chip development into uh, new application spaces. Um, so going back to the block diagram a little bit, I want to push down into some of the detail of what's inside one of these uh, typical task-oriented engines. So we developed this concept of a, uh, a template for a task-oriented engine. And the, the way this works is uh, the unique function of the task-oriented en engine is embodied in the processor core that's shown in green here. Um, but, and then the surrounding blocks are common to every one of the task-oriented engines. And so the, these blocks are shown in, well, we reuse some of these blocks, like the ones shown in blue here, the DMA engine, the task control unit, and there's a power manager for each TOE. And so this reuse of blocks that uh, are part of the platform, it makes these uh, heterogeneous engines uh, have a similar look and feel or a API to the programmer um, to make uh, his job a little easier. Um, and then the blocks shown in red here are, um, our simple bus managers and arbiters and so forth, and we actually have gotten to the point where we uh, have a utility that lets us uh, uh, generate uh, validated Verilog code just from a simple ASCII specification of these blocks. So it makes it very easy to, uh, to uh, achieve the interconnect among all these blocks and build one of these task-oriented engines. Um, so using this kind of technique, um, so our design productivity has uh, gotten to the point where we can do something like a 3D median filter engine in uh, just a couple months. So next I want to zoom in a little bit on that task control unit there that's resident in every uh, task-oriented engine. Um, the task control unit, um, he, uh, again, I mentioned he's the main block that does synchronization among all the tasks in the system. system. And uh, so he has three main blocks, the command FIFO, the task command processor, and the TCU registers. And the, the semaphores are the most important registers in here. Um, the, the command FIFO, he, he uh, holds register rights that are um, to be uh, uh, shipped into the task-oriented engine. So his main job is to decouple the control engine setup of this task-oriented engine. And so he can hold these register rights that are basically thought of as thought of as task setup commands or task descriptors. Um, and he also holds commands that are directed to that task command processor there, shown on the other side of the FIFO. Um, in our implementation, this command FIFO is 256 elements deep, and so it's generally enough to hold for anywhere from about 50 to 100 tasks. Um, now, the task command processor, his main job is to offload the low-level task management from the control engine. So, in a way, you can think of him as a nanoprocessor as opposed to a microprocessor. He has a small instruction set that lets the control engine in the system kick off sort of a lightweight thread here on the other side of this queuing. And so he allows the control engine to run ahead and be able to, to queue up further commands to all the task-oriented uh, task engines in the system. And so the task command processor does these four main things I have uh, in the bullet, bullets here. He can pass through writes from the TOE. Uh, he can uh, do mon local status monitoring of the TOE. He can wait for a local semaphore to be set in these registers, or he can go out and uh, set a remote semaphore in another TCU or control engine in the system. So if I haven't lost you completely by now, hopefully maybe a little animation will help show how this all uh, works together. Um, I have... Um, uh, it's, I'm showing here a simple uh, configuration of a media DSP with a couple of these crunch engines, an external memory DMA engine, control engine, shared memory. 
And um, these TCUs are shown sort of blown up here so you can see the Q that's inside and the um, semaphore registers that are resident there. And so we'll take this simple task flow graph of a DMA uh, input operation and the number crunching operation and a DMA that's going to go back out to SDRAM. So the first thing that will happen is the control engine will load up the um, control for this simple task flow graph. So he has a task right now running in the DMA engine that you can see there. And the task command processor for the DMA engine is waiting for that task to finish. And the crunch engine at this point, his, TC, his TCU is um, simply waiting for a semaphore to get set. And behind him, you can see there's a, the green task that's blocked up uh, in the queue there waiting. So once that DMA finishes, uh, he will send a signal up and set that semaphore, uh, removing the block for that crunch engine. So now the crunch engine can process, the DMA engine is in a position where he's waiting for that control engine or that crunch engine to finish. So the crunch engine finishes and it sets the semaphore. And so this is how basic synchronization is achieved. And so this is just a simple demonstration for a simple task flow graph. Of course, in practice, there are many more of these uh, parallel engines running and there are many more elements in these queues, tasks queued up. Um, and so, I, you, but you get from this picture, you get the basic idea of how the architecture allows the control engine to dynamically set up the control flow for a generic task flow graph but then the communication occurs uh, without any of the risk processor being involved. The, T, uh, uh, the TCUs or TOEs synchronize automatically between themselves. Um, the Media DSP has a multi-level memory hierarchy uh, with DMA engines to move uh, between the levels. Um, and in order to uh, guarantee real-time performance, we've exposed this memory hierarchy to the software level. Uh, giving the programmer the ability to schedule DMAs at the optimum time so that you can hide the effects of um, high latency and variable latencies that are associated uh, with the typical SOC devices. So I mentioned the crunch engine a few slides back. Um, this engine is it's one of our key task-oriented engines because of its uh, programmability and its focus on video processing. Uh, this engine is a general purpose DSP engine with instruction set tailored toward uh, video and image processing. It has a full complement of SIMD instructions and reduction instructions as well as others. Um, one of the key goals of the architecture is to keep the data processing path busy as much as possible. So we've employed techniques like uh, zero overhead loops, predicated execution uh, to make loops efficient, and we've uh, built in um, alignment logic uh, into the operand selection and write back paths so we can avoid shifting and masking that is uh, commonly required with uh, register based uh, SIMD processors. And also, we have hardware support for streaming data types to allow uh, address processing to happen implicitly. So, uh, as an example, the efficiency of our instruction set, we can do a 16 tap FIR filter at one sample per clock. Um, so, a couple highlights about the instruction set. The crunch engine is a very CISC-like instruction set. It has greater than 300 instructions. Uh, some of the heavy hitters I show here in the slides, and um, this, these just kind of demonstrate the kind of uh, high throughput that can be achieved by application-specific instructions. And then finally, you see this theme again of deterministic execution time. We've uh, used a dedicated instruction store with uh, without a cache and by exposing the hardware pipeline, pipeline to the programmer, uh, it's easier for the programmer to do his cycle budgets and to meet real-time constraints. So a quick run through the block diagram of the crunch engine. You see at the top we have a couple of DMA engines that have a streaming feature that works in concert with the processor core. Um, the pro at the top of the processing core pipeline there's a program sequencer. The uh, 8K byte instruction store holds uh, 2K instructions. We have a three-way address generator that has an array addressing model and streaming addressing model, which is helpful for video operations. Uh, four kilobyte local store, 64 byte output store, and then the alignment logic for um, reading and writing results. And then finally, the 120-bit processing pipeline. Uh, a few words about profiling. Um, we knew that this was going to be an important part of, uh, of the job in developing parallel applications for this type of processor, especially one where the software has such low-level control of the hardware. So uh, we've built in this uh, profiling capability so programmers can see how well they're doing parallelizing their problems. 
Um, we have a flexible scheme that allows both hardware and software-based events to be traced. Uh, the software-based events can come from the control engine as well as the task uh, command processors. Uh, so you can get some pretty detailed information about uh, what tasks are waiting on which semaphores or how long tasks are spent in queues and so forth. And then finally, we can take a trace buffer out of this in running silicon and convert it into waveforms so you can get an idea of the parallelism that's being achieved uh, by the programming. So on to some of the obligatory physical specs. Um, our uh, X420s in TSMC 65 nanometer process, 400 megahertz. Uh, typical power of a single media DSP core is 1.3 watts at one volt uh, with 106 million transistors per core. Um, in terms, and we have 22 processing elements for each of these cores. And so for uh, in peak integer op performance, we have about 800 ops of programmable perf performance. And if you include um, the application specific type engines, we're over uh, 1,000 GOPs of performance. So on the chip as a whole, we're at more than two tera ops of uh, peak integer performance. So uh, wrapping up, uh, so some of the things we've learned over the course of the, of the development of the past few years, um, we've learned that uh, our platform-based approach uh, has allowed us to uh, rapidly develop video processing solutions for two diverse applications um, using this common platform, and we expect this to continue into future video processing problems. Um, we've learned that it's important to have programmability when attacking ill-posed problems that require uh, flexibility to tailor uh, for uh, customer preferences. And by setting up a template for how heterogeneous engines plug into our platform, these heterogeneous engines uh, can have a similar API, which uh, eases the programmer's job. And then finally, uh, our support for various types of cores in the system lets us have the best of both worlds. We can use programmability where flexibility is required or we can put in fixed function modules uh, to save cost and power. Thanks a lot. That's all I have. Time for a few questions. Hi, my name is uh, Kieran O'Donnell. I'm from uh, K-Force Professional Staffing. Um, my first question is, do you have a compiler for the Crunch Engine, and could you describe its architecture? <laughs> um, no, we do not have a compiler for the Crunch Engine. <laughs> Um, and luckily, we, you know, we haven't needed one. Like this system is a, uh, generally a deeply embedded system, and so we have been programming it in assembly language. Um, not that building a compiler wouldn't be possible, but it's um, you know, not within the realm of uh, what our team is doing. And my, second, my second question is, um, what quantitative data do you have, like uh, the BDT, BDTI or e EMBC benchmarks? Um, we, we have not done any sort of general purpose uh, benchmarking of the platform. You know, as I said, it's, it's really more of a, it, uh, this is for like targeted embedded systems. You know, at this point, that's what we've been uh, targeting. And, you know, we are a product development group and we're trying to build, you know, cost effective systems and um, are not really targeting toward general purpose operations and so forth. But I would love to do that if you know somebody who could help us with <laughs> Okay. okay, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Last question. Nathan Brookwood from Insight64. Uh, could you say a little bit about the communications fabric that's on the chip? Uh, it's, arc, it's a topology, maybe latency, bandwidth, those kind of things. Uh, right. So, um, so in this chip, in this latest chip, we have uh, actually there are five separate uh, backbones. Well, e each backbone has a separate uh, request and response uh, uh, backbone to it, I guess, you know, split transaction type of bus. Um, we have a 132-bit bus for control type operations, and there are 428-bit buses, um, or backbones, I guess I should call them. I really shouldn't call this buses, but, um, um, and, uh, yeah, the latency, I don't know, maybe 10 cycles or something like that to get a, you know, a read a result from one, from the shared memory. Thank yeah. you. Okay, same next yeah. speaker. Thank you. So we now have a short break. Please come back in about 25 minutes. Thank you.